to do our second one a little bit different from the way we did the first one, which was our trial. Wait a minute, did something happen? YouTube's behind it. Oh, but, but we're, we're on. Hold on just a minute. Let me get, this, get some clarity here. What's going on over there? I had to switch it over uh -huh. in OSB. Okay. okay. Oh, so, so we're live now. We're, we're still, still live. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that little bit of a glitch. We're still learning how to do this. I'm still learning how to do it. Um, so we're going to focus the chat this time on a subject. We didn't last time. Last time we were sort of just freewheeling it and just getting, uh, getting our toes wet, so to speak. But this time we're going to focus on a subject. And let me point out here now that um, if you're a member, if you're a Studio Insiders member, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. So if you want to ask questions and you're not a member, uh, you can click the Join button, pay a little fee, $4.99 per month. Uh, that will get you the membership. It'll get you the right to ask questions, but it'll get you a bunch of other stuff too because every first Sunday of every month, uh, we send you a free video snippet from one of my video tutorials. And then every second Sunday of each month, you will get a coupon uh, for a free download of a full video lesson from the website. In case you don't know, the website is dianemize.com. You can go there and find there are 170 full-length lessons and some full courses and a bunch of free stuff too. Okay, most of you already know that. Um, so, we, I'm ready now, I think, to take questions, and I'm waiting on you to ask them. So, if anybody has a question about, are you having any composing problems with your paintings? You know, when you first uh, put that first brush, brush stroke down on your canvas or on your paper, if you're working with a water media medium or uh, one of the other mediums, when you put that first stroke down, whatever it is, you've already started composing. So this, I'm open to uh, answer whatever questions you might have about composing your paintings. So what do we have? It's sometimes suggested to put, oh. <laughs> um, questions in all caps, we, well, it doesn't matter, I suppose, whether we put questions in all caps. But anyway, questions. Hello, all, hello. Um, let's see, I guess I should recognize you. If I start recognizing everybody by name, I'm going to trip up all over myself. So hello to all of you who are saying hello, and so happy that you're here with us. I'm waiting for a composing question. So I do, do I need to say something else about composing? Uh, well, for one thing, when you, uh, before you ever start a painting, it's a good idea to explore your subject. Now, I'm a full belief that every painter should also have a sketchbook. So that would be your first step. If you don't have a sketchbook, get a sketchbook. Uh, I think you will find it's so much easier if you work out your compositions, uh, at least work them out roughly in your sketchbooks before you ever start putting paint on canvas. So that would be my first suggestion for getting started. Um, so I don't see any questions coming in. Um, are they coming in and I don't see them? Uh, no. Okay. Um, no, all right, let me ask you this. Are you clear on what we mean when we say composing paintings? Does anybody have any confusion about what we mean when we say we're composing paintings? Okay, here's one. Wonderful. How can I keep from putting everything I see in my painting? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> That's a good one, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> Well, it's a little bit of self-control, you might say. Here's, here's something other than a smart aleck answer, though. What is your focus? What interests you most about the scene? 
Now, if you're in plain air, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that uh, that's, that you're bombarded with, actually. If you're working with a photo, either you or somebody else has already crystallized that into some form. So uh, the first thing, uh, the first thing I would say about in answer to that would be what interests you about that scene, what interests you most, and then start with that thing that interests you most, and then what else is in the in the scene that relates to what interests you most. So if it doesn't relate to what interests you most, for example, if you're if you're uh, painting a scene of a farm, if you have a farm, if you, let's just say I'm visualizing a barn and there's some cattle around the barn, maybe they're going in for milking time or something like that. Um, that's the thing that interests you. Okay, so if there's a wheelbarrow out in front, is that part of the scene? Is that part of what you want to include? So you go you go through and eliminate anything that doesn't enhance what you're interested in, what you want to focus in most. But don't eliminate everything. Eliminate things, uh, include things that are going to guide the eye or play a role in guiding the eye toward what you're focusing on. Uh, the, they can play that role too, even, even though they're not part of the scene. So I would say the best thing is to know what your focus is, know what it is that interests you, and then include those things that can help you pull the viewer's eye in uh, towards what interests you and leave other things out. So that's pretty much a self-control thing, but it's also getting clarity about what it is that you're wanting to paint to begin with. If I didn't answer that completely, um, maybe you can ask another question. Now let's see, what's that one? <clears throat> Bridget, uh, how much do you need to know about the, there's an error there I can't see. Oh, the golden mean, okay. How much do you need to know about the golden mean ratio before you start painting? Nothing. You don't need to know that at all. What you need to be aware of are uh, placing images so that they're going to give you uh, a balanced composition. So it's not the golden mean that you need to know about, but um, you, you need to understand something about placement. Now, there's a, a general way you can start out there, and that is simply by, um, if, if you look at your rectangle within your, um, your format, you can divide visually or mentally divide it into three parts, the rectangle, Three, uh, put two lines vertical and two lines horizontal, and that will give you uh, thirds. Everything would be divided into thirds. Then if you will place your image uh, somewhere along either the axis of one of those linear divisions, either vertically or horizontally, or place your image somewhere uh, in, the, in the vicinity of where those lines intersect, that's a good place to put your um, Im image of interest, or some people would say the center of interest. So I don't think it's necessary for you to know the golden mean ratio. It doesn't hurt to understand the golden mean ratio, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary for you to know that in order to uh, begin a painting. Okay, before you start, this is Suzanne. Before you start to compose, you have to choose a subject. That's where I freeze. Now, okay, look, uh, don't worry about that. Pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to what you're interested in. What pulls you to a thing? What causes you to want a painting to begin with? That's where you begin. It's just that simple. There's no, there are no rules that are going to be governing you. There are only principles. And those principles are simply to, act, to use as tools to, in order to place things. So what interests you? Focus in on what interests you and start there. And then just add things that would, within that composition, that will enhance the thing that interests you. I hope that helps. You know what? 
people make so much of a deal about the whole uh, uh, process of choosing images and everything. I always say refer to your heart. If it doesn't interest you, you why paint it? You know, paint only, uh, go to only those things that, that pull you to them, that tell you they, that you want to know something more about them. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not interested, if you just want to do a painting for the sake of painting, um, well, you know, set up a still life. And, and if you just want to practice, just set up some, yeah, just have a subject to practice with, set up a still life. Uh, grab two or three uh, things around you that you enjoy looking at and put them together in, in a still life or something like that. But um, don't freeze. Just to relax and allow your your eyes to go to something that interests you. So that's about all I can. Okay, here we go. This is Lisa. How do you link large shapes in in what? No ten. Oh, in no ten. Oh, all right. How do you link large shapes in no ten? No ten. Uh, is about light and shadow. Now, so they sh the, the, the way the light shines, from wherever the light source is, uh, the way the light shines on something is going to produce shadow. And the shadow can be, uh, the shadow can include all kinds of shapes. The, the light just doesn't decide to hit one shape and not hit another. So if you think about this, uh, locate wherever the light source is, that light source is shooting rays of light out. <clears throat> wherever those rays are striking, <clears throat> pardon me, wherever those rays are striking, um, you're going to have light. But where those rays cannot hit, you're going to have shadow. So that whole air, a whole area that is in shadow is going to link images in a no 10. So when you're looking for the just a shadow and the light for producing no 10, you don't think about the images at all, but you just look for shadow. And by the fact that you look for how shadow links those images, that's the way you're going to make it happen. Uh, all right, Joni. <clears throat> Pardon me, y'all. I've got seem to have thousands of little froggies competing right down here today. Uh, could you talk about how to work with three values to make a composition design? Okay, we get our values from, I'm going to go to it again, we get our values from the way the light is hitting surfaces. Now, where things are, where the light is hitting surfaces is going to be in a value range of about, well, if you're talking about a 10 value scale, that value range is going to be from about one in that, if you're talking about a 10 value scale where one is the lightest light, I should say it that way. Uh, where the light is hitting is going to be in that range about one to four-ish. Where, where things are in actually in shadow are going to be on the other side in a range of about 6 to 10-ish. In between is a transition area. Now, what, how that, the, the way that interprets into three values is that you have to average all that out. You establish uh, a, the lightest of your, if you have three values, pardon me again, <clears throat> let's take a little coffee, can't cure that. <clears throat> Now, if you have, uh, if you're going to do a composition of three values, then you will average out three, or you average out in the light values, of those values that would be falling on the scale into one, two, three, perhaps four. You decide. And that's where your lightest lights will be, wherever you place those. Those values that would be closer to the transition the lower parts of light through the terminator, that's where the, the light falls in a shadow. And then the lightest part, a shallow shadow, somewhere in there, you determine. You make that determination. 
but all those areas would be your middle value if you're doing a three value composition. And then uh, all, the er the, all the areas that are left in the dark values, and you might say everything from maybe six through 10 or seven through 10, all of that would be indicated by the darkest values. So when you're doing a three value composition, what you're doing is you're designating a group of values to become one value. So a group of light values that might vary will become one value in a three value composition. Then the group of values that would be designated as middle would fall in that middle value of the composition. And then of course the group of values that you designate as dark would be the dark values of the composition. So uh, that's just expanding it from the note 10. In the note 10 you have two values that designate light in one value and shadow in another value. So if you're doing a three value, you're just expanding that. Um, did that clear that up, I hope? All right, the next one is Mary's art. What would be, uh, what would be, what would being able to see values have to do with composing everything? Um, because within the composing, you're showing the weights and the structure of the values. Now without light and without dark, without light you see nothing. So you don't have a composition if you don't have any light. Uh, you might even say if you didn't have any dark, you would see nothing. So that range of values, however you structure your values, is going to determine how the eye is going to flow, well that and the shapes too, but you'll be surprised how much that the values or the contrast of values is going to determine how the eye will flow throughout the composition. And so uh, it, it means everything. Uh, now, I don't know, it didn't sound like I made that very clear, but maybe you can, if I didn't answer it clearly, ask another question that focus me, focus, focuses me just a little bit more. Uh, there's Penny who says, I'm still not clear about transferring the composition to the canvas. Transferring the composition to the canvas. Um, <clears throat> well, it depends on how you are, what your process is. Now, um, if you are cre if you're getting, if you're creating your major composition uh, in a sketchbook, which is what I always recommend. Um, there is a way you can transfer, if, you, if that, that exact composition is, um, is right on the nose of what you want for a composition, and you want, to, want that to go onto your canvas, and then we would assume that if it's in your sketchbook, it's going to be smaller. And it doesn't matter what size your canvas is. It can be you know, 6 by 8 feet, or it can be 6 by 8 inches. It doesn't matter. But what you can do is one way to do it. Now there are several, I do, uh, well, I'm not even going to entertain that. I'm going to tell you one easy way to do that. First of all, the proportion of your composition, the portion, proportion of the sketch that you make in your, in your, in your uh, sketchbook, it needs to be the same proportion as your canvas. So say if your canvas is 18 by 24, uh, then the, the, ske the sketch must be 18 by 24. Uh, the sketch would be either 9 by 12 or 3 by 4. That would be the same proportion. Then, if you will divide your sketch into, th into thirds across and into thirds uh, vertically, so that you end up having nine divisions, nine sections, on your on your uh, uh, on your sketch in your sketchbook, then do the same thing to your canvas. Divide it into exact thirds, uh, two lines vertically and two lines horizontally, exact thirds. Then every one of those sections is going to correspond. So you can you can look at the the, the upper corner section. Whatever appears in the upper corner section would then you would transfer in the exact proportion to the upper corner section of your canvas. So that's one way uh, to transfer it, if you want it to transfer exactly. Um, I hesitate to say this, 
But there, another way that you could do that is to project the image uh, from your sketchbook onto your canvas. I always hesitate on that one because I really object to projection. A lot of times people will project a photograph onto their canvas and they'll just trace that, and that I object to strongly because that uh, doesn't give you the freedom to compose. But uh, those two, I would say stick with the grid method if you want to get, it, it, get an exact proportion. Um, so maybe that will clarify that for you. All right, Suzanne says, I'm still experimenting with ways to start. Uh, I've tried um, sketching, the wipeout method, um, transferring my drawings. I try to use the rule of thirds. It seems different subjects demand different starts. Um, well, I think it might be important for you to find a process of starting that works best for you. Now, um, setting the preliminary drawing first um, is always a good idea because that's the placement of shapes. So I think it's always important first to know how those shapes are going to be placed on that canvas or on that paper. And I don't think those, those certainly don't need to be done in detail. I have uh, several quick tips, I mean, one especially, and I can't remember which number it is, but you can check on uh, starting a painting or the placement of shapes. But to place those major shapes on your canvas in a preliminary drawing then shows you how that space is going to be divided on the canvas. Now, my suggestion and uh, is to, the next is to take as the next step to uh, show on that canvas the light and shadow indication. Of course, that's my that's my approach, but I like that as the second step because that tells me then that sets the pattern of light and shadow. And of course, that's with the no tan. And you know, on a larger canvas, it would be done just with a very light wash. Uh, on a smaller canvas, you might uh, you might use um, something like the Tombow pen. But anyway, if you if you don't want to do that, well then the the second step would be to do to approach it as a block in and block in in a sequence that makes sense to you. Now some people like to begin by just blocking in the the middle values first, then the dark values, then the light values, just as a general block-in. Uh, I, I prefer starting with the darker values, to block those block the darker values in just in general block-in, then the middle values and the, and the lights. Uh, but I think the important thing is to find a sequence that works for you. And when you find a sequence that works for you, forget everybody else's sequence because you gotta remember that every artist has their own way of approaching a painting. And a lot of them will tell you that that is the only way. And I'm saying, no, that's not the only way. The best way to approach, the, uh, to, to approach a painting is to develop a sequence but to develop the sequence that works best for you. And sequence means, what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? They'll re they'll, you will reach a point where your sequence will merge into the process of painting. But um, that would be my answer there. Okay, the next question is from Catherine. In what way can you draw the viewer to an important object in your painting? Well, there are several ways. <clears throat> One way is by the, uh, by the way you, well, a lot of people say where you place the object, well, that may be true, but the way your lines in your composition or the images in your composition, the way the lines lead to the image. So you may have, uh, you might, when I say lines, I mean the visual paths, the visual, uh, the visual rhythm that will lead to the image, but those are created by uh, contrast. Now, there are two major kinds of contrast that can draw 
the attention to the image. One is by value contrast. Um, now, there are degrees of value contrast. Strong value contrast, strongest light against the strongest dark, is going to attract the eye. The more narrow value contrast, like uh, maybe a, 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 a maybe a darker gray against, I mean, a darker middle value against a lighter middle value side by side, will draw the viewer's eye in as quickly as a strong value contrast. So the strong value contrast, finding ways to put a, a, a strong value contrast within the vicinity somehow, and of course that would be determined by how the light is shining on it. But then another way is a, a, a color contrast, and that could be either uh, some way, of course we're talking so generically here because every image has got its own uniqueness, uh, so, so how the light is shining on a subject is going to be de going to determine that an awful lot. But you can uh, a highly saturated color against a lower saturated color is going to pull in emphasis. And then there another way of giving emphasis is as controlling the edges of the image. The softer edges, the eye is going to flow over. The sharper edges, the eye is going to stop going to stop, pause, let me say, not stop. The eye will pause at the sharper edges. So a, a number of those things, but I don't think you should say that as an exact answer to that. Um, the placement is certainly going to make a difference in, in how the eye goes, but the way the way that other images are pointing, pointing toward an image uh, is going to help pull the eye towards it. So. Um, I've written about that kind of thing an awful lot in the little Saturday tips I send you. Um, so if you're not signed up for the Saturday email, you might go there, you might uh, go to the website and sign up for the Saturday email. And then there's an archive there where you can go and uh, see uh, all the tips I've already sent out and you might find more help there. But uh, generally speaking, in any way you pull attention to an image is um, is going to cause the viewer's eye to go there. So it might be how other things are pointed towards it, or it might be value of contrast, it might be hue contrast or, or um, saturation contrast, um, or it might be edges, the sharper edges versus uh, the softer edges. Now I haven't covered everything, but that maybe can get you started and then you can do prowl around and do a little bit more research um, and, and find all those ways. Okay, Anne says, have you ever composed a painting from a piece of music rather than from a visual image? Yes. <laughs> of course, those of you who've been with me for a while know that uh, I really love um, the, the I, I, lo I love the relationship between music and painting. And uh, uh, there have been times when when I would, uh, it's been a long, long time since I've done that, but I have done that where I might just allow, uh, put on some Chopin and allow the the um, up and down or the rhythm of the notes as they're moving throughout the piece kind of guide my hand as it moves across the painting. It's a fun exercise. You might try it sometime. Okay, Natalie says, how do you personally decide what to add, leave out, and make a focal point when composing your landscapes? There again, we go back to what interests you about the landscape. You know, we could get a dozen of us uh, sitting out in the same spot in a landscape, and, each, and, and uh, each one of us might come up with a different painting with a different emphasis. So... The answer pretty much there is what I said before. First of all, what interests you most about it? Why are you interested in it to begin with? Are you interested in the entire landscape? Or is there something particular within this, in the landscape that is pulling you to it? And then, there's, don't, add, don't just put everything in there that you see. You will, you will notice, and I, I can't really talk, talk specifically about this unless I'm referring to a specific image, but you will notice, you should notice, 
that there'll be certain things that will uh, will accent or will say something about that landscape that you're painting. And there'll be other things that will be in there or might be in there that won't be emphasizing it at all. So say if, uh, uh, if there is, uh, okay, I could think of all sorts of things, but if, if in the landscape, this is just an example, but it's not necessarily a true example, but say there's a bunch of electric wires going into a barn. Now, some artists would say, would, would say that those wires would act as a wonderful little enhancement to show the, uh, something about the barn that is connected to electricity, I don't know, something like that. Other artists would say, no, that's garbage. I don't want that, I don't want that in my painting. So I don't have an, a specific answer for that except to say, don't put it in there if it doesn't enhance what interests you about the landscape itself. So you make those decisions. There are no rules about that, but the, uh, there are principles that say you want order. You want order. You don't want, you don't want chaos in your work. You don't want it to be so loud. It's got so much going on in it that nobody can see what interests you about it. So start with the thing that interests you, and you can even begin to leave out stuff that don't really interest you. Uh, and then as painting develops, you might see, well, maybe I need a little bit more texture over here, or maybe I need uh, something over on the other side that would pull the eye more towards what I'm really interested in. So I think I'll just leave that there. Um, Jenny, should one start using saturated colors or less intense colors first to start painting? Ha. <sighs> Well, that sort of depends on the medium you're using. Now, with watercolor, if when you're using watercolor, if you start out with the uh, the color the paint too unsaturated, it's awfully difficult to get it saturated towards the end of the painting because watercolor is transparent. So, if you're painting in watercolor, it's a good idea to. Uh, not necessarily to begin with saturated colors, but where the saturated colors are, place those relatively early uh, and not have to worry about putting the saturated colors in earlier. As a general, I don't like rules, you know, I don't like making rules about things, but just from the practical, from the practical point of view of painting, or you might even say from the technical viewpoint, um, Use those saturated colors to enhance. So if you've, got, if you've got lots of saturated colors in a painting, if you're painting in oil or acrylic, um, pastels, you've got to be careful about because they can go dull awfully quick. But think about it like this. The saturation of the colors should not be in great amounts. The saturation of the colors should be there uh, to accent uh, what the subject is about. And you will only see, well, you will see your greatest saturation in the areas of where um, sh light goes into shadow. Those are where the greatest saturations of color appear. So I would say build it as you go. So if you start out building from shadow to light, when you reach those saturated areas, you can go ahead and put those in as you're blocking in the painting. And you see there, there's really no specific answer, but the, the main thing to be, be cautious about is to, first of all, don't put too much saturated color in. But second, let it fall in um, so that technically you're not going to have any problems later. Uh, maybe I didn't, I don't know. You have to let me know if I'm giving, y'all have to let me know if I'm giving you you, uh, if I'm confusing you or if, if I'm helping, because I won't know until we listen to this and then I'll probably say, oh, I wish I had said this or that. All right, Mary's Art again says, yes, oh yes, it's clear, good. Explains why my thumbnails of this particular painting look so boring. <laughs> Everything looked dark, not enough value, if that makes sense, yes. All right, tomorrow, tomorrow, in starting a painting, is there a set of three to five questions I might use as guideposts for consistency in approaching the composition. 
Um, in starting a painting, is there a set of three to five questions I might ask as guideposts for consistency in approaching the composition? Placement, <clears throat> three or four questions. Don't ask too many questions, you'll get confused if you do. Um, I think the placement of images is probably the most important. And when you're doing the placement, okay, here we go. One question, check the edges of shapes to the size, the, the edges of your canvas. You don't want, uh, you don't want there to be the same degree of space, same, same size of space between the, in, the edges of the image themselves and every edge of your canvas. So if I'm thinking, for example, if you had a vase here or even a barn or whatever, you want to realize that you have placed that into a limited space. So you want that space to remain interesting. Uh, and it won't be, it will have a head start of having potential for being boring if you have all the spaces between the edges of the shape and where the and the space between the canvas, if you have all those the same size, you've already started out with potential boring. Now, so so uh, always check in that check the edges against the edges to be sure they are not um, the same sizes. Also, check the edges internal. Check negative space against positive space. Be sure that how you have placed your shapes that you don't have too much re repetition of size within the negative and the positive. You want to give variation where you can give variation. Um, let's see, questions to ask in the beginning. Uh, be sure, when you set your light in dark, when you set the shadow and not in shadow, you don't, it is going to be confusing if you have an equal amount of light and an, e and an equal amount of shadow. So you might double check. Uh, have you chosen um, have you chosen more light than shadow for for the whole composition, or more shadow than light? It can be in any unequal proportion of light to shadow, but. Uh, if you have an equal proportion of light to shadow, you run a risk, I'm not going to say it will, but you run a risk of it feeling unbalanced. So we, we need that feeling of one, domin one being dominant in amount and the other being subordinate. Uh, the amounts don't matter, they, they, they've got to relate to wh uh, what, what kind of sunlight you've got or what kind of, if it's not sunlight, the light source and what the light source is doing. Um, just getting those basic things uh, placed, um, there are probably other things too, but that maybe gets you started. You know, I had, I've not thought about three, quest, three to five questions to ask myself, so good for you for thinking of that. Uh, by the way, y'all, I know somebody suggested that you, uh, you might put, it, put your, your messages in all caps. I'm having trouble reading the all caps, so kind of drop the all cap notion. Uh, Roger's highlighting these for me so I can pick them up easily. Okay, Caroline, uh, can you see, no, can you say some more about rhythm in a painting? Okay. Um, yeah, there's lots I can say about the rhythm in a painting. Rhythm is created by movement Movement is created by edges that um, edges move in only one of three ways. I should say, yeah, that, that's pretty well. Now, edges can move horizontally, edges can move vertically, and one of four ways, four ways. Edges can move diagonally, or they can move in a curve. And the fifth way you might say, say, I keep adding to this, the combinations of those. Now, when you have a single edge that's moving in a direction and it pulls the eye, that is a, that is a rhythm. It's moving this way. If that edge, if there's an edge of another shape that's moving in an opposing direction, then you've got 
this kind of rhythm. You've got more or less a long, slow, but directional movement that moves in this direction and in this direction. If you've got curves, you've got a more gentle rhythm that's moving however the curves are moving. Usually when we're creating or we're giving attention to rhythm in a painting, we don't want everything moving in the same way because that is boring. So we want to give a movement that would move in this way and another movement that might move in that way or a movement that would move in this direction or that direction. That is a kind of rhythm. Now, uh, other things that can create rhythm in a painting would be the amount of texture that you might have in a painting that would create a very fast rhythm. So if you have, say, if you were, if you were really focused in on a... A uh, tree in the wintertime, a, um, with a tree without its leaves in the wintertime. You focused it, focused in really, really close, you'd have whole lots of movement in there with all those limbs and twigs and whatever. So you would have a very fast, fast rhythm going on in there. Uh, but if you chose just to uh, focus in on the limbs themselves and the trunk, you want to subdue, subdue the twigs and all that, you, then you might create a slower rhythm. The longer the line, the slower the rhythm. The shorter the line, the faster the rhythm. But the rhythm should play as a guide to keep the eye moving throughout the painting. You think of rhythm in music is very much like rhythm in painting, in that in rhythm in music gives us a um, gives us a way of moving or hearing the sound move. If we didn't have, if you don't have a rhythm in music, um, we're not very, we're really just really not very pulled to it. You know, if it's just, if it's just something that's a combination of ir, um, rhythms, uh, uh, rhythms that don't belong, they're just chaotic rhythms, we're not really interested in staying there. But if there, there, there could be a slower rhythm that pulls you into a slower mood, it could be a faster movement that pulls you into a happy dance, well, in painting, you can have the same sort of thing. You can have a slower rhythm with slower, longer lines, the curved lines, the combination of the curved lines and the straighter lines. Um, and, and one thing to think about that too is, is kind of what we think of as, a, uh, in a straight line, we think of repose. So we think of the straight lines as being more restful a more restful movement or rhythm. So anytime you have movement, and movement, you always have movement in a painting. If you have lines, you have movement. So anytime you have movement, you're gonna have rhythm. Well, the object is to create that rhythm in such a way that the eye stays within the painting. Uh, so let's just get some, uh, I don't know. I'll leave that one at that and see where we go from there. Okay, Martha, uh, why is understanding the vanishing point, in, in, vanishing point important in creating composition? Well, I'm not so sure it's that important for every composition you create. Vanishing point has to do with how our eyes see. It's not just a rule or something that's a bunch of rules that somebody made up. All, all what happened was that Brunelleschi back in, what was it, the Middle Age? Not the Middle Age, back in the Renaissance time. Brunelleschi noticed, because he was an architect, he noticed that our eyes see uh, lines moving towards a vanishing point depending upon where our eyes are. So our if our eyes are at a level like this, and we're standing in the middle of the road, our eyes are seeing those lines of the road actually move upward and join in the vanishing point at the area uh, that's exactly our eye level. Now, in some cases, when if you're painting uh, space, if you're painting something, if you're painting inside a room, if you're painting a landscape, uh, even well, it doesn't hurt sometimes if you are, if there are groups of people, 
Knowing how to find a vanishing point can often help you to put things in proportion so that you can guide that person's eye to see it in proportion the way your eye sees it in proportion. And for that reason, I think it's probably important for every visual artist to understand the principle of the vanishing point, how our eyes see things coming together, and we wouldn't be able to move around in space if we didn't see things in perspective. And that's what the vanishing point is all about. So I would say it's not always necessary to, to be able to locate a vanishing point ne necessary in every single painting you do, but I'm saying also being aware of the vanishing point enhances your freedom as an artist, enhances also your ability to place things so that our eyes will move uh, in a kind of a three-dimensional, uh, in a three-dimensional interpretation, the same way as our eyes uh, see in a three-dimensional interpretation or in a three-dimensional world. Okay, what's next, Roger? Oh, we got some thank yous. All right, Jenny's. I made it clear. Good. I never know if I'm making something clear because I do have a tendency to ramble. <laughs> I enjoy rambling, uh, but good. It makes it clear good to my uh, feeling like I'm always starting from scratch every time I start a new painting, like I've lost everything I already know. The questions will be a big help. Good. Hey, look, tomorrow. No, no. Once you've had the experience, you don't forget it. <laughs> we, but also it's necessary. It is absolutely necessary. Every time we start a painting, to approach it, to approach the subject as if we have never seen it before. And the reason for that is that will allow us to discover something different about the subject, something we might have taken for granted that we really hadn't noticed before. So no, we never lose it. It's, it's like when you get used to riding a bicycle as a kid, uh, you know, years later, if you go several years without riding a bike, you might kind of have a little bit of a rough start, but it comes back. So when you have an experience, that experience is still here with you, and it's never like starting over. So take a deep breath and say, yes, I can, yes, I can, yes, I can. All right, Joni, a few exercises for improving our composition. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> for improving composition, exercises for improving composition. Ah, um... So, there I have thousands, and you don't want me to do that, I'm sure. Um, I think one wonderful exercise for making yourself aware of composition um, is to start out, is to, in your sketchbook, in your sketchbook, start out with a, uh, a rectangle that is about three by five inches, no larger than three by five inches. Then, uh, within that rectangle, just start by dividing the space in a horizontal way. Now, what I mean by that is you take a line, you draw a line from one edge to another, but try to draw that line so that it is below or above the center. Then, once you've done that, look at what you've got. Then, in that, in one of those shapes, you've got two shapes that gives you two shapes. You've got a larger shape and a smaller shape. All right? Then, take one of those shapes and divide it into two shapes, but don't divide it equally. So, you might go anywhere. I say don't divide it equally. Equally, it doesn't matter. You can make go go to and make one very long, a very short shape, or a very long shape. However, just one. Now you've got three shapes. Now within those three shapes, make one uh, have three values: dark, middle, and light. Make one shape dark, another shape middle, and the other shape light. Then go and create another rectangle the same size, do the same kind of division, make one shape dark, one shape light, and one shape middle, but in different places. Do a third one where you do the same thing. And then compare those and 
look at what it tells you about what light, middle, and dark values do to dividing space. It's just a little simple composition that can inform you an awful lot. You pay attention to it. Let it talk to you. Let, all, let, let the whole set talk to you. Uh, I think you will discover that, that may also then lead you into other kinds of shape division. But we can learn an awful lot about composing when we take the imagery out and we simply compose space. Uh, so I think that once you can get the, the sense of you're, you're actually composing space, just like the, the musician is dealing with sound, you're dealing with space. You're actually composing space. And what happens in that space determines the composition. So if you can do just one little exercise like that, now, um, you know those little, those weekend tips I send you? I often say, try this. And a lot of those do have to do with composing. So you might go back and revisit some of those as well. Okay, Terry, I'd like to hear some thoughts about composing an abstract. I just did. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not necessarily the distortion of an object. Yes. Just, I can pick up on what I just said. Abstract painting is painting your your composing space without images now you might be comp composing space with image but terry said specifically not necessarily distorting of an object in other words terry wants to know about composing abstracts without using images all right so you've got what have you got to work with there you've got a blank canvas you've got 10 values You've got zillions of colors. Each one of those colors has potential for 10 values. And each one of those colors has potential for multiple degrees of saturation. So to start somewhere, uh, you could take, do that same uh, exercise. You've got to think in terms of composing space. Now, within that space, you've got the possibility of geometric shapes. Geometric shapes start out very simple. We've got square rectangle, we've got triangle, and we've got circle. Now, when you start composing just those, overlapping some, uh, having some to, to float just in negative space, that then can help you to begin to get a sense of what it's like to compose uh, abstractly without images. You can also compose abstractly without images just by using a uh, rhythm like uh, like Jackson and Pollock did, where he was just he was just uh, throwing paint, but he was creating rhythm and texture textures that create rhythm. Um, that we can write treatises on that. There are there are complete textbooks that are about composing space. But I think to the 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 initial thing, if you're interested in abstract abstract is to first realize that you're just simply working with shapes, values, and colors. The visual language, you're working with shapes, you're working with values, you're working with colors, you're working with textures, uh, you're working with sizes of things, you're working with the direction that things are moving in, that the images are moving in, but that is your subject. Those are your subject without images and so it's learning how to use those subjects within that two-dimensional space with color with value and well with line texture and those kinds of things so all abstract painting is is removing the image and using the visual elements as the imagery as the language itself all right laura how do you handle making a value line in watercolor um Okay, first of all, in watercolor, you don't use white to create your light, you use water. So you think of the water as your light. Now, the colors that comes out of the tube, especially the dark colors as they come out of the tube. Oh, I know what you mean, you mean a value line like I do in my painting. We, uh, what I like to do is, uh, well, go back to what I said, the water is the water is what changes the value. We don't have white. We do have white, but it changes to opaque when we put white in it. And what I do, what I like to do as I'm going, 
uh, I'll, I'll set, set out the, the darkest, darkest colors here, here. But, but then, then because the water dries, dries evaporates so fast, it's, it's impossible really to set up a true value line, line on a palette. palette. But, but what I like, I like to do is I'll start, start out with that darkest color there, and then I'm conscious of the water as being the light. And so I might set I might set a value line for me to read. I might set it on a sheet of paper, but I very rarely do that. I'm just aware of when I have that the water in that brush. I push it just to the edge of the watercolor and pull out just enough, and then I check the value to be sure that's in the value that is the value that I want. So. Um, it, the, the value line that I use in oil is pretty much, um, um, pretty much, you might say pretty much restricted to oil because of the nature of oil paint. But the concept of thinking in terms of the value line is applicable to all mediums of paint. Okay, Debbie, I love the single concept format today. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I think we're going to continue that. So if we can have every one of our discussions focused on a single subject, back then I think it can be more meaningful to all of you who watch and all of you who, who participate. And for those of you who might be watching and would like to participate and find out that you can't, I said it at the beginning, I'm going to give another plug now. Um, join. Um, this is one of the perks to be able to ask the questions for in our discussions. It's one of the perks of being a a channel member. This is YouTube membership now. This doesn't have to do with our website. But for a member of our YouTube channel, members are called Studio Insiders. And so you can join. It's a monthly fee, but it also includes uh, perks, uh, a free video lesson every month and uh, a free snippet every month. And so you'll get used to those things. And those of you that have trouble downloading them, will get used to that too. All right, next question. Um, ah, you're welcome, Joni. <laughs> Look back into those quick tips. Yes, they're there. Uh, Debbie, do you have a great quick tip recently about space compositions? We do have, Roger, can, do you have, uh, I don't have the quick tip list right here. Space construction. Space construction, which one is that? 301. 301, check 301. There's another one too, the one uh, where I did, did some time back with that where I was using color. I was showing how to use color. But space construction, quick tip 301, addresses that very topic. Okay, do you, who's next? Who's next? For all of you that are saying thanks, you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, great. Uh, when will this be posted? Uh, almost immediately after we finish up. Pretty quick after we finish up, it'll be posted and available for now, I guess, right? Within the quick, well, within our channel section. It'll also be in the members folder. In the members folder, be in the members folder and be available to everybody. Yeah, it'll be very available to everybody. What, everybody. Everyone, whether you're a member or not, it will be available, just as the quick tips are. Two minutes. Oh, we have only two minutes, and I just got started good, for heaven's sakes. All right, give me a question. Who else? Mm, okay, it's really helpful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to ask questions. Wonderful. It's my pleasure to give you that opportunity. Thanks for being a member so that you have that opportunity. Um, so are there any other questions? We've got just two minutes. Two minutes, so we, um, there's some at the top there. Something's coming down from the top, and I can't see. Hmm? No. Oh. Okay, okay, is that gonna be it? Really have grateful questions. Okay, thanks for the reminder about this. You're welcome. Um, you got a shout out. What? <laughs> I got a shout out. Oh, oh, Roger got a shout out. Yay, Roger is the background. Roger is our producer. We're in his studio right now doing this. Uh, Roger has been our producer since we started this thing, and he will always be our producer. Uh, and so he's really, Roger's in charge of the YouTube channel. Everything that happens on YouTube is his domain, um, as well as all the filming and editing and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, all right. So is that pretty much it as far as the questions? I don't see any more questions. And Roger tells me, he gave me the two minute. I imagine it's just one minute by now. It's three o'clock. It's three o'clock. All right. 
thank, thanks, thanks to all of you for joining. This was uh, went by a lot faster than I thought it would. So uh, we will do this again on on the third. We always do this on the third Sunday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, do you have something, Roger? Just a reminder to uh, click the bell. Oh, and, and click yes. On the all. Yes, to get notifications. To get notifications. All right. This is for all of you who are here and all those that will be watching this later. It's important if, uh, in order to know, always keep up with what we're doing and to, to get your perks when you, when you join, click on that bell. When you subscribe, click on that bell so that you get notifications. Now, if you're just a subscriber, um, when you click, you click on that bell, when you subscribe, then you will always get a notification every time we put out something new, new video, new quick tip, or whatever. If you are a member, when you join, you click on that notification, you will always get in email everything we send out. You'll get your coupon for your free video, you'll get the free snippet, uh, you'll get the announcements, and I'll be sending special messages to you from time to time. Now, you've already joined but you don't know whether you click the notification. If you, you've got an icon, you, you have to be a, you have to have a YouTube account, you can't do this. So uh, you've got an icon, you click on your icon, go down to settings, and then in settings, you'll see a, a, a little section that will ask you to uh, set, your notif set it to receive notifications. If you have that set to receive notifications, You'll get all the email. You'll get an email every time we send something out. Now, if you don't get yours, check your spam folder. We've discovered that uh, dear old Google, as well as maybe a couple of others of the email people, will often throw these things into spam. So if you think you have something coming, it didn't reach you, say, check your spam folder, and then set your email so that it won't do that anymore. Now I don't know how to do that right now. Okay, I think that's it. Wait a minute. Uh, you can watch the recording, uh, Krista. Watch the recording later. Yes, it will be available very soon. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you all for joining, and I look forward to uh, another chat with you next month, and we will announce what the topic of that chat will be uh, closer to the time. So that's it for now. Bye-bye for now.